I'm going to talk about Node. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to give so much of an introduction to it um, because I, I kind of gave a rather long one a while ago, and there's this video on the internet. So I kind of figure, like, if you want to know about it, you could, you could watch that, that video, and I don't re really want to waste your time so much. Um, so here's my introduction slide. Um, Node is a server-side JavaScript platform. Uh, it's built on V8. And um, it's really good at handling lots of I.O. at the same time. And not necessarily like lots of server connections. It does that fine. But also lots of different types of I.O., like standard input and standard output and a Unix socket and a TCP socket and files and just kind of all of this different I.O. all at the same time. Um, and it does this um, in a way that's not at all new. Uh, it's what Twisted and what Event Machine do, um, which is making the network I.O. non-blocking and using an event loop. Um, yeah, and the file I.O. is, is asynchronous. Um, which is a little bit new. So it has a built-in thread pool so that um, whenever you call like some blocking system call on, on some file, which system calls usually are on, on actual hard drive files, it actually goes to a thread pool. So you, you kind of get this complete non-blocking environment. Um, and so just a very simple demonstration, um, this is a little program that listens, starts a web server and starts a TCP server at the same time. And the web server is listening on port 8000 and the, the TCP server is listening on port uh, 8001. Um, and when you connect to the web server, you get hello world. And when you connect to the TCP server, it tells you how many people have connected to the web server. Just, just an example that you can throw multiple lots of different types of I.O. into the same program rather easily. Um, right, so, so here's, a, here's a reference to uh, the other video. So I want to talk about speed, actually, um, in Node, because it's, it's pretty important. Like, everything is speed, actually. If, if the program's not fast, then it's, it's basically worthless. And um, I think uh, it's important to, to make an environment like this that is supposed to be for writing servers and stuff as fast as it possibly can be. So um, what I want to do is, is try to describe to you how Node is fast and maybe some things that are not fast about it. Um, just kind of put a realistic perspective on you know, what is this, this node thing, and really, how fast is it? Um, and so to do that, uh, I'll give some, uh, a couple of benchmarks. And I'll benchmark against Nginx, which is um, a web server written in C, uh, and is really, really quite fast. And uh, maybe there's the possibility of a faster web server. Um, but I think we can take Nginx as kind of like the baseline. This is what is possible. And you probably can't get much better than that. Um, and then we'll, we'll benchmark Node. And then we'll benchmark two uh, web servers for dynamic languages, which is Tornado um, and Thin. Uh, Tornado's uh, Python thing, and thin is a Ruby thing. Um, and I just did it on this, on this laptop. Um, these, these benchmarks aren't really meant to be real, necessarily. It's not just trying to simulate like actual what would happen on a website. Um, because basically, we're going to hit it with more load than is achievable on a single like network device. Um, all, th all four of these web servers can saturate your bandwidth, right? They're, they're all quite fast. What we're interested in is, is more about how they perform under very high load levels and just see if we can bring out any problems with, with them. 
<clears throat> so let's, let's just start with the standard, like, hello world uh, web server. Um, and what we'll do is, is we'll just hit it, we'll hit each of these with Apache Bench and um, look at how they differ with different amounts of concurrency. So hopefully you can see this. I'm not sure if it, okay, looks visible. Um, so, so here's, here's the, the, the three control servers, right? Nginx is on the bottom. Okay, wait, so, so concurrency is, is the horizontal axis. That's how many people are connecting at the same time and uh, the vertical axis is response time. So you want to be fast. You want to be lower down on the graph. So smaller is better. So, so Nginx looks really good. It's at the bottom, as expected. Thins somewhere in the middle, and, and Tornado's a bit slower. Again, the actual numbers here aren't really so important because they're probably not, uh, you probably can't achieve this sort of load, actually, <laughs> in real life. But the point is, Nginx is quite a bit faster than, than the other ones, by a factor of two or three. So if we add node into there, then it looks like this, which is good, I would say. Um, it's not really comparable to Nginx, but it's, it's looking good when compared to Thin. Um, So now let's, let's, let's do another benchmark. And um, instead of just sending a hello world response, what we can do is, is f fix a concurrency and, and vary the response size. So you know, send a five kilobyte response, send a 10 kilobyte response, and see how the web servers uh, deal with, with these different amounts of throughput, basically. Um, and so, so, well, ignore that bottom line. Here's, oh wait, okay. Yeah, so, so basically this is, this is what the node web server would do. Um, this is for 16 kilobytes. So you, you just generate some, some string of data and then you, you, when somebody connects, you write that string to the socket. So this would be for, for 16 kilobytes, but we're going to vary the amount of response size. Okay, so, so, Again, here's the control servers. Uh, and uh, again, response time is, is on the uh, vertical axis and Nginx looks really good. And it's, it's approximately the same as what we saw before. You know, Thin is in the middle, Tornado's a little bit slower, um, and Nginx is at the bottom. So let's, let's add node into this picture. Um, Remember here, this is two to the 18, so that's like 256 kilobytes or something like that. Um, and this is, you know, your basic hello world program. So, you know, they, they slow down as you, as you, uh, as they send larger responses. So let's let's add node into this picture, um, and I'll let you grasp this for a second. This is not good. <laughs> That's a bad spike. That's not a good spike. Down here, they look okay. We, we can't really see, but it's pretty similar. But as, as we start getting into large response sizes, Node sucks, right? <laughs> Node really sucks. Um, you're, you're, that was like three seconds, over three seconds for, for a 256 kilobyte response, that, that's terrible. It's not Rails terrible, right? <laughs> I mean, this, this is at 300 uh, concurrent users at the same time. Okay, Rails would be off the map here. But it's not, it's, it's a different order of magnitude than these other servers. They're doing something right and Node's doing something wrong. So, so what's, what's actually happening here? Well, V8, the, the, the virtual machine that Node runs on, has this, is very complicated, and um, has this generational garbage collector. So it moves data around inside of its own heap. And so um, V8 won't actually give you a pointer to the data, like the actual data of a string. You have to copy the data out of V8 into your own 
heap outside of the V8 heap, and then you can write it to socket. So every time node writes something to, to a socket, it copies it out of V8 and then copies it to the socket. So I think in the other uh, um, web servers, they can take strings and write them directly to the socket. So to address this problem, um, I've added a, a, a buffer object to, to Node, which is very simple. It's just um, it's a chunk of memory. It's a chunk of memory that's outside of V8's heap that um, you can modify and write directly to the socket. And so this is what, what the example would look like with a, with a buffer. You know, it's, it's binary data. So um, it doesn't look very string-like, but you can fill it with data. So, so here we're, we create a 16-kilobyte buffer, and then we write it to the socket. <clears throat> so let's look at the benchmark with the buffer. Now things look OK. Actually, things look really OK. Over here, with, with the buffer, Node is basically matching Nginx for speed, which is, which is pretty impressive considering that you know, Nginx is this highly optimized C program, and Node is this completely dynamic you know, thing sitting, written in JavaScript, written, uh, sitting on top of this virtual machine. Um, so, so that's good. Um, <coughs> Yeah, so, so, so these buffers are pretty fast. Like, Node can push these, these buffers directly to the socket, and, and it, can, it can do it very well. So if, if we just go back here, and we just took like a cross section right here at, at like the 256 kilobyte case, and, and just looked at a histogram of, of, of these response times here, just to, to get an idea of, of how this looks. Um, now response time, it's a histogram, so the response time is on the, on the horizontal axis here. So you want to be over there. That's fast. This is slow. And Nginx has this, this great spike here, meaning it's fast. And Node has a larger variance, which is not so good, but it's, it's getting in very fast responses. It's also getting in some slow responses, too. The slow end is... is equivalent to the fast end of, of thin. And Tornado's kind of out there. So, but the fact remains, I mean, if, if you just took the, the Hello World program that's on uh, the Node website and, and you, you know, adapted that to, to write out a large string to the socket, it's going to be slow and, and it's kind of unacceptably slow. Um, so hopefully this, this can be fixed in the future. Um, you know, what, what might have to happen is, is we might have to modify V8 so that, you know, if, if V8 doesn't want to uh, give us a pointer to the data inside their heap, which is completely reasonable since they're moving around data, all that they're moving around these objects, you know, maybe we can give the right system call to V8 and say, hey, V8, here's this file descriptor. Can you write that string to the socket? And just let it deal with, with its own memory issues. So that, that might be a way to, to solve the problem. <clears throat> anyway, so the, this buffer, uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, and it's one of the new features in Node. Uh, it's what you would expect. It's just a very simple C buffer. You can you can allocate it, and you can adjust the values, and you can um, encode strings into it, and then decode strings out of it. So if you actually have like a big file that you want to write to the socket, it's probably good to allocate a buffer for it, write the file into the buffer using this, and then write that buffer to the socket many, many times. So like for a static file server, that would definitely be the way to go. <coughs> Importantly, you can't resize buffers, though. So they're not completely string-like. You can't just kind of append values to them. Um, yeah, Chris, Chris has been talking about having some like higher abstraction on top of buffers, which would be totally possible, where you could you know, just append strings and stuff. But under the 
underneath it would be, it would be buffers. That, that would be possible. We'll see how it turns out. Um, right, and so since, since the 1.90 release of Node, which was a couple weeks ago, um, Node is, is mostly written in JavaScript now. It used to be, um, back when I, when I gave the talk last November, that, that most of Node was, was kind of C, and it just kind of had this, this thin binding layer. And so most of the algorithms that Node used to push data to the socket and, and all of the stuff that it was doing was basically opaque because it was kind of inside this, this C realm that people don't really want to touch. Um, and it's, it's hard to modify. I mean, C is a hard language to just manipulate. And so um, now, now most the, the, the binding level is much lower. It's basically at the POSIX layer where you just kind of bind certain calls and then the rest is written in JavaScript. And this is working out really well. Um, so, so part of the rewrite was, was to get this buffer thing that we needed because getting strings out of V8 was so slow. Um, and also just because, you know, strings aren't really an appropriate data type in JavaScript for binary data. I mean, you, you can pack arbitrary binary data into strings, but it's just somehow it, it's, it's not right for that. Um, but the other part of the rewrite, in addition to just kind of making things more JavaScript friendly, um, was, was to unify this concept of, of streams. So Node had all these, all these different um, objects which, which would stream data, um, but they, they, they had different interfaces. So like you had a HTTP request object and it emitted this body event. You know, if somebody's uploading a movie to you, it'd say body, body, body and you'd get uh, various chunks of the body. And for a HTTP response object, you would have this send body function. So you could, you could send stream data back to the, to the user. And a TCP socket had a receive method. So when you got, when you got data on, on the TCP socket, it would say receive, receive, receive. And then it had a send method to send data. You know, it's like the POSIX calls. That made sense at the time. And, and uh, standard I.O. had like this data event when you read stuff from, from standard in and it had this, this write event to write to standard out. And you know, kind of very slowly in my very like sloth-like mental capacity, like I came to realize like, huh, maybe, maybe I should like not be making up new names for all of these different things every time we came up with a new stream. Um, and the more I thought about it, again, very slowly, um, that like unifying these streams would be very cool because if we did that, we could, we could actually do polymorphism. Like we, we, could, we could write general purpose functions that dealt with streams that could like do things. In particular, we could write like a general purpose pumping function that would take data from one stream and pump it into the other one. And we could actually do this in a really good way with all the proper throttling and stuff. And it could be all on one event loop and we could just get a callback when we're done with it. So maybe you, somebody's uploading a file and you just pump it to the standard out if you wanna see what it is. Or you pump it to a file. Or you pump a file into a, into a response. Pumping data throughout a process is a very common thing and it would be nice if we could just put it into a single function, basically. <clears throat> um, so the, the stream interface, which I will describe to you, is, is split into two parts. Uh, it's readable and, and writable streams. Um, some streams are both readable and writable. They're duplex, so like a, like a TCP socket. So the readable stream looks like this. Um, it has a data event. You receive data, and it says data, data. Every time it's, it's continually pulling in data. And when you get an EOF or a fin packet on TCP or whatever, if, if maybe it's a fake stream, maybe it's, maybe it's an HTTP request in a pipeline's HTTP connection, so it's not actually the end of something. But may, you have an end event when this data terminates. 
And then you have, you have some things for throttling, so you can pause that, you know, stop. I can't deal with more data right now. I'm, I have to do some other stuff and resume. And then a destroy method, which would just kind of terminate everything. It would close the underlying socket. It would say, okay, I, can't, I don't want any more events right now. And the, the writable stream um, has a write method, basically. Um, it has a write method and an end method. So you write data, and then you end it. And then for, for the purposes of, of you know, the, the, the kernel write buffer might fill up. And at, at that point, the write method is supposed to return false. And then you would listen for a drain event. So you write all this data, it all fills up, and you say, you know, I can't, the kernel can't handle pushing out more data to the interface right now. And so you just wait for that to drain down, and then you get this drain event. And then you can fill up the, the buffer again. So, I mean, with, with, with this drain and this read, this pause and this resume, you can actually, you know, take data from here and pump it into there. And then when this one returns false from right, you know, because the, the, the buffer is filled up, then you say pause, okay, I can't handle anymore over here. And, you know, wait till, wait till this data flows out here. You know, if you're pumping something from a very fast connection into a very slow connection, this is likely that will happen. So you need to be able to handle the, these sort of throttling issues. <clears throat> um, yeah, so just as an example, there's lots of these streams inside Node. So uh, like standard input would be a readable stream, and a server request would be a readable stream. Like somebody's uploading a movie to you, that would be something readable. And, and if you launch a child process, the pipe into that child process to the child process's standard out, that would be a readable stream, right? Because the child process is writing stuff. And, um, and then the opposite for the writable streams. Um, yeah, the stream interface. I mean, it, it, I think it needs to grow a bit organically. Um, there's probably more that needs to be added. So, for example, there probably needs to be some sort of low watermark for, for writable streams to, to say when, when, they should, when they should actually drain so that, so that they don't um, push data out to the socket immediately. <clears throat> okay, so uh, what else is happening? So, um, for rather technical reasons, uh, Node had this UDNS library that used to do asynchronous DNS lookups. DNS is extremely complicated. Like, there's no way I could possibly write my own DNS library. I, I would like to, but it, it's, it's infeasible. So um, I was using this UDNS, um, and that's been replaced with, with a similar library called C Aries. Um, and when we did this rewrite of, of these streaming interfaces, we used to use new TLS for the, for the um, in the C code, but, but now we're going to switch it out with OpenSSL, which is um, a bit more available. And uh, you know, usually you have OpenSSL installed on your computer, whereas you don't usually have new TLS. Um, but the side effect is that these, two, these new TLS and UDNS um, kind of rhyme. Um, they, they were both LGPL libraries. and um, with this replacement, um, all of the libraries that Node uses, and Node itself is, is um, rather simply licensed. This last sentence isn't correct, 100% MIT BSD. I mean, OpenSSL has this Apache sort of license, but it's, it's rather okay, and OpenSSL is kind of this big understood library. So this is only good if you're like some company and you like can't touch GPL code at all. Well, now Node is pretty free from that. Um, another thing that, that uh, was done recently was, was a repo library, um, which we had already, but you could only do it on standard I.O. Now you can do the repo library on arbitrary sockets. So you could start a TCP server and put the repo on the TCP server so you could telnet into your process and examine what it's doing. 
but that's a bit dangerous. You probably rather want to open a Unix socket and uh, Telnet into that Unix socket. Um, but this is cool, right? You can have a running web server and you can Telnet into it and inspect variables while it's running. And it can completely demonize and everything and, and be de detached from a TTY. Um, so yeah, here's, here's an example of, of, um, of starting uh, the repo on a, um, on a Unix socket. It's, it's pretty trivial. Just copy those three lines of code into your program. Um, and then uh, there was this other thing, this promise.wait. So Node had this thing where when you did like a file operation, you, it returned a promise. And then I had this, this weird thing where you could wait on that. And it would, make the, 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 it would make the operation seem synchronous in that instead of having to do a callback after that file operation because it was asynchronous, you could wait on it and it would just return the value. And then right under that, you could do the next line of code as if nothing had happened. But it wasn't really synchronous. It was just kind of faking it. It was switching to a different execution stack and calling other events. And then when it was done, it would switch back to the original execution stack. This was a terrible idea. Um, coroutines suck. Like, <laughs> don't listen to Brian Mitchell. They're, they're terrible. <laughs> We don't have these in the web browser, right? You don't, you don't have multiple execution stacks in the web browser. You get events, you call functions, and then you return to the event loop. And then another event happens. It would be terrible if you were in your web browser environment and you called all these functions and then kind of like in the middle of your call to jQuery, somebody else called a button, clicked a button, and then that event started while your other stuff was like being paused. And then that other button event, you know, screwed up all the state of, of what was happening in the original function call, in the original event. And then when you return back to this original function, can you follow me at all? Probably not, I'm just waving my hand. Um, the state is all messed up. There, you have to, thinking about coroutines is hard because you, at any function call, you have to be prepared for the fact that I.O. can like, somehow happens, somebody, you know, I'm going to call this function and then in some library down the line, somebody's going to call wait and it's going to jump to the event loop and then IO is going to happen. So if I just have a parser and I'm like parsing a socket happily and then I call a function and then suddenly like, you know, now more data re comes in on the socket and, and my parser starts on that data and then when I return to my original function, like the state of my parser is completely different. What would have to happen if we had coroutines is we would have to have locks around the parser. We would have to be really careful about what the state of, of, we're, of what we were doing. And we had to make sure that when uh, you called a function that you were aware that there was a possibility that anything is going to happen at that point. It's not as hard as, as thread safety. Coroutine safety is easier. In thread safety, you have to worry about these atomic issues. I mean, in, in coroutine safety, you can, you can copy an array to some place, and it's not going to, to cut right in the middle of, of that array copy, copying. But it's still difficult. Let's just make life easy, OK? It's, it's hard enough. No coroutines. Let's just have events. We'll call some functions, and then it will be done. The coroutines don't add anything. If anything, they make our program perform worse. The only thing that they do is give you this kind of, you know, pleasure of having like these calls one after another, which I agree is, is kind of nice, but it's just not worth the mental anguish. So cooperative threading of any sort is a terrible idea. Um, the other thing that's going on is, um, yeah, the project is growing. And now we have a build bot, which does continuous builds and, and runs all the tests. And it even like does performance tests, just like in the Chrome project. So on every commit, <coughs> it runs a set of benchmarks and displays it on a website. And so we can see if we commit something, if suddenly that makes the rest of the project slow. And we can revert that commit. Um, so, so 
um, yeah, the project's growing. Um, there's been a lot of interest in it. Uh, there's been 42 releases, and there's 63 contributors. Um, it hasn't grown that much in code size, mostly because of this rewrite. Um, but we've got over 1,000 people on the mailing list and 1,000 people on GitHub that are watching it, so, so it's, it's nice. Um, yeah. Are there any questions? What's the threshold for the terrain event right now? What is it right now? I mean, you mentioned lowering the watermark now. What is it right now? If at any, it writes to the socket immediately. So, so you're going to, to as, as soon as you, you write something to a socket, it flushes it. It tries to flush it. Yes? Where does module, dynamic module reloading stand right now? Um, reloading, dynamically reloading modules, like hot reloading of modules, like, you know, when you're in Ruby on Rails and you update some code and then, you know, you go back to the website and it's changed. This is hard. This is really hard to do. Like, I, I thought this would be fairly simple, but it's not. Um, and the problem is you, you're just kind of carrying around these JavaScript references and you just can't, you can't really switch out the implementation from underneath them. Um, there's been several attempts. Um, none of them are, are very satisfactory to me. Um, there's some new development going on in V8, which does uh, live editing, uh, kind of at, at a very low level, which um, I think is the proper way to go for, for doing this sort of thing. So I'm, I'm waiting for V8 to figure it out. Yes? How do you think the state of the API is going to affect uh, the amount of modules? Uh, right. So, so, so I want to stabilize the API very soon now. Um, I, I want to do this at a 0 0.2 release. I mean, I can't completely like say I'll never change it again, but I, I want to like not change it every day, okay? And I want to like. Thank you. So, so there's, there's been a lot that needs to be done. That's why I change it all the time. Um, I hope that, that uh, when I, I reach this 0 0.2, um, which should be in a couple weeks. I've been saying that for weeks and months, but it will be in a couple. I wanted to have it done for, for this conference, but it's not. Um, I hope that, that people will start building modules on top of Node at that point. Huh? More modules, More modules please. Yes, there, there are some of them. OK, that's it. Thank you.